All right, good old holy black powder. Springfield trap door. Let's go ahead and take out that watermelon. <laughs> oh boy, look at that. Ah, smells good. Smells good. Let's smoke a pot with some smoke. <laughs> it's a smoking contest. Look at that. <laughs> Let's make some more smoke. Good old Springfield trap door. Watch me shoot through that two liter and hit the cowboy. <laughs> Dead center. All right. Pretty cool. Yeah, look at that. Nice. <laughs> yeah, Hickok 45 here. Uh, almost forgot you were here. With a Springfield trap door. You've seen it in a couple of videos uh, in a group of firearms, and you've been after me for years to do a video just on the Springfield trap door. And so I want to get right on that. Okay, so finally getting to it. Oh, as I stand here, I can just oh, smell it. Uh, the sulfur. So, yes, uh, we're going to do a oh, Springfield Trapdoor exclusive video on this particular firearm, as you've been requesting. And as you know, it doesn't take much to talk me into it because it's a really cool rifle from a, well, I guess it was a cool period of history. I wasn't there, but uh, the firearm is very cool because it is historical and uh, also has a lot of history associated with it, okay? uh yeah so in any way but this you know we're not making youtube videos because i'm a genius uh it's just because i like to shoot so every time i open my mouth you can tell that can't you this is a neat firearm i don't have to tell you that and so are those because i got those out not because i'm going to do a big big comparison but they all relate to the history of the springfield trap door in some way okay and i'll just briefly uh, point that out if you uh, have not seen our video on all the, the U.S. military rifles, you might want to take a look at it sometime. This one, I think, was in that video. And uh, But we're going to focus mainly on this. All right. It's a 4570. And it the originally, of course, fired black powder cartridges, which is what I just fired. I hope it doesn't cake up in the barrel. It's a hot day here. And uh, really just totally destroy whatever accuracy I can uh, get out of the thing. Because that can happen. It really can. But I can always run a lube uh, patch through it there and probably should, maybe in the middle of what we're doing. Um, I'll probably shoot some smokeless as well. You've got to shoot light loads. Let me say that early on. You want to focus on uh, lighter loads in these old trap doors, these Springfield trap doors. That's why when you go buy a box of 4570, generally, and I'm not sure about this particular round. This is uh, 300 grain from Federal. They furnish a lot of that for us, and we appreciate the help from Federal, of course. Uh, I think I have fired those in there. They're a jacketed round, and I've read you don't get as good accuracy out of the uh, trap doors with jacketed ammo but I, yeah, I don't know how much truth there is in that but um i think i have fired some of those that's probably okay to fire i may or may not i don't know i'm firing mostly my light hand loads i got some black powder rounds from buffalo arms i got to, to i bought to to shoot to, so i could shoot some black powder just four and five grain ammo because that's pretty much let's see i got some in my belt here that's pretty much was the round i think it was more like that than a, a wad semi wad cutter because uh, at that time there were no, in 1873, let me think, there were no lever action 4570s. Uh, and that's what these are good for because you got that flat nose. So you can, I can stick those in my 1886 and there was Marlin. There were other firearms that were chambered for that in lever guns. And you got that flat nose in the tube, so that, that's safer. But in 1873, uh, th this was pretty much it, I think, unless I'm just not thinking, yeah. Uh, so it was okay. It was around those. It's just one round at a time, and these are black powder. So that pretty much simulates what they went with. It was a 45-70-405. That was the designation of the cartridge because it uh, was 45 caliber, and it was uh, 70 grains of black powder, and it was a 405 grain bullet, and that's what I'm holding right there. The same thing, okay? Except it had a copper case and they did have some trouble with those copper cases that's why they uh, eventually went to brass the copper was softer it uh, expanded more and it would hang up in the chamber 
they had some problems with that. I'm sure there were people killed. It's kind of like uh, the early version of the M16, you know, in Vietnam, where they, they were using the wrong powder. The, the uh, chambers were not chrome. They did some things that quickly corrected that, as I understand, with the M16. But those early ones, they told the GI, yeah, I really need to clean this thing. It's high tech. And they didn't use a, a what was it, a fast enough burning powder or something. They used the wrong powder. And then, uh, so they corrected all that pretty much, I think, by, chain, by uh, chroming the chambers and changing the load and, you know, there. So it's kind of the same, same with this. So anyway, that's black powder. I've got those separated. Not that it matters a lot in terms of safety at all, just so I know whether I'm firing black powder or smokeless. And again, if you're shooting smokeless in these, you don't want a hot load, all right? Because uh, they're not, they're not, they weren't designed for magnum loads. Uh, so that's the trap door. Let me go ahead and shoot it again. I'll put the, uh, just to prove to you, you can shoot smokeless in it if it's not a, I'll shoot a couple of these, as long as it's not a barn burner, uh, you're okay. And is that a cool mechanism or what? It's on half cock. But uh, the way that trap door works, I, John and I just are very fond of it. So fond, we're going to shoot a two liter. <laughs> you put it on half cock, flip that thing out, put another one in. I'll put that one in. I have my pocket. Put it back down, and you go bowling right away. <laughs> so now, even though it's not a Magnum load, it is a 4570, and it's a 405 grain bullet. So, you know same old deal there like uh, we talk about with other things uh it's it's not nuclear it's kind of like getting hit by a, a camry instead of a, an suv or something you don't want to be hit by either one of them they're both very powerful they, they have a lot of weight and a lot of a lot of energy the uh let's shoot uh let's shoot another one uh my left side over here the uh i think the original round it uh, sent that 405 grain bullet out at about 1350 round or feet per second Okay. They also had a lighter load for the carbine, the cavalry uh, version of this. Let's go ahead and put one on the gong. You want to? Oh, uh, yeah. That was fun. Let's put another one on the gong. <laughs> Let's try the red plate, actually. I think I know where to hold, even though I don't have a, back, a rear sight. <laughs> go <laughs> talk about having to use kentucky windage that's one thing you notice i'll get these uh pick these up later well look at that would you how'd i do that how did i turn that case around oh my and i'm in battle oh no <laughs> uh there is no rear side on it so we just kind of look down through the groove there and it's almost like shooting a shotgun with just a bead or something but if you take a really fine bead, we've uh, been able to hit pretty well with it. Uh, this is, uh, you notice 1884 on the lock plate there. Uh, based on my research, uh, this firearm I purchased at a gun show many years back. I was contemplating getting a replica of this. And you know, even then they were running around a thousand or more. You know, I, I just kind of wanted one. I ran into a guy who had this and the stock has been refinished. So it was the collectible uh value is not really there uh and and i wasn't sure about it it looked like okay i don't know maybe something's been replaced not a big deal but for the price i got it at i, I didn't care i said well i'd rather have this than a replica anyway i don't care you know what might be missing the sights or well, this is cool and so i purchased it best i can tell i was reading uh just recently that if you've got 1884 on the lock plate that means it was not made at springfield <laughs> uh they they sold a lot of their parts to salvage i think in the late 1870s maybe early 1880s they sold a lot of them and i was reading that so there were so many of those parts on the market that people were buying them even companies and making guns out of them entire firearms and selling them and they didn't like that so they quit selling them parts of salvage and so so i just don't know maybe uh we know that because maybe springfield armory did not stamp 1884 on any of the ones that were made in 1884 or the 1884 models you know on the bridge plate i, I don't know exactly how we know that uh obviously i don't but somebody seems to uh but that's okay uh i guess all these parts uh, were made by most of them by springfield and i don't know about the lock plate i don't know but it works uh, maybe you know more about it, which wouldn't take a whole lot. The serial number, though, on the receiver dates it as 1884. 
okay so uh there you go so i'm not sure exactly in terms of uh, what i have it, it, you know it's obviously not a, a valuable firearm but it's pretty cool because i think it's all old and it's just missing the sight i guess if i found one of the sites because they did upgrade the site in the 1884 models uh and um, if i found one that was too expensive maybe i'd stick it on there okay but if it's you know several hundred dollars i probably wouldn't be interested because actually you know we can shoot the thing enough to enjoy it without the rear sight so so that's kind of what I have. Somebody's done some work on it, refinished it. Not a big deal. It's, a, it's an example, and it's old. It's an example of the old Trapdoor Springfield. And, and actually, when you find originals that are like all intact and you know, collectible, some of those aren't like horribly expensive because there are a lot of them out there. They're a single shot. They're not a real complicated mechanism. Uh, so you see them actually reasonably priced uh, you know, for something this old. All right. What else can I lie to you about? Well, it came about, and guess when? 1873. If you've seen our video, I think we called it 1873 or something, a great year, whatever, for cartridges and firearms. Uh, this was one of the biggies of 1873. This was the first, oh, guess you'd say, general infantry issued firearm like this that was a breech loader, fired you know cases and you know all that kind of thing. Up until then. Most of the firearms that were issued, and there were exceptions, were like this baby, right here. 1861 Springfield, this one's specifically 1863. And uh, yeah, that's what we did. We used a muzzle loader for the most part. We all know there was the Henry rifle and there were exceptions to that. But as far as what was issued to you know, most of the soldiers, it was this, or the infield in the South or whatever. And after the Civil War, they got to looking around and figuring out what to do and cartridges you know had been around so look we got to get into the cartridge game here it's it's uh there's too many cool cartridges the spencer you know the the henry and others and handguns the future was cartridges of course so they're trying to figure out what they could do and it was uh the erskine allen i guess at the at, at the plant at the at springfield that kind of designed it i believe and it was you know, cutting out the breech, imagine that. So you see these guns are very similar. I believe I might've held these up together in uh, another video even. And they just cut it out and they actually took these rifles. Now this one is made this way, the way the, all the 1873s are. But up before then, from the end of the Civil War up until about 1873, I guess, they were taking these old rifles because there were so many of them out there and they were cutting out the breech and creating this gun out of this because it's essentially the same firearm. Okay, so there were different variations of it. And then in 73, they, you know, this was, you know, they, you know basically this, uh, you know, from scratch is to just build a, a breech like this instead of, you know, take these old guns and cut them up and, and create one, ha cobble one together. So that's how 1873 came about. They were, they were chambered. I read uh, these that they, they took in 1866, 1867 and on up. They cut out the, uh, the breech and they, made, they relined the barrel. And these mostly were 50 caliber, I think 50, 70. And so they relined the barrel and you know, rechambered the things. That always strikes me as something that would be really hard to do, relining a barrel. You know, especially back then in the 1860s. But, you know, what do I know? I'm not a gunsmith. But, wow, that's impressive to reline a barrel and have it. Uh, I just can't imagine how you go about that, how you start that even. But uh, they did that. And, uh, but then they went to, in 1873, a smaller uh, bullet, you know, than the 50 caliber. It was determined that 45 was maybe a better. Even though it was smaller, it would uh, have less trajectory and be more effective. Okay, so that's what they did. So 1873 was a big year. Uh, and we all know, I've got the 1873 wind uh, Chester out here, that's a Uberti, uh, that that was available too uh, in the 4440. Interesting, huh, that they adopted this for the military. Not only had the Henry been out for, what, 13 years, but we had the 1873. And uh, that's you know, considered one of the very best lever action rifles you know, of that time but yet the military didn't adopt it. And, uh, you know, various reasons, uh, the military's always been afraid people will waste ammo. 
and you had the lever and shooting from a prone position. So there were different different issues like that, uh, expense to make it, and, and all that. Although it was used, those were used by some foreign countries uh, in in the military. But anyway, they went with this, and it shot the bullet I talked about, and it loaded like that. So very interesting rifle. If you've ever uh, held one of these or operated it, you know what I mean. It's just something. The, the cool factor is really high on it. It's, just, it's so cool. I'm going to shoot it again. Okay, can I do that? You just lay it in there, put it in the chamber, and they would train the soldiers to uh, to be able to, to reload and fire about 15 rounds, maybe even 20 per minute. How's that? Let's kill a ram. Yeah, 4570. This would be a good hunting hunting piece. Let's shoot another black powder. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> I'm a glutton for punishment. Let's see if we can take that other ram out with a smoky round. Oh man, yeah. I didn't see him fall because I had a little uh, problem there with smoke. <laughs> but I heard him. So yeah, this was uh, this this firearm. It was used in a lot of uh, battle skirmishes. It was uh, used in the Spanish American War. You know, and then they, uh, some of the soldiers down there in Cuba had, had the crag. That's why I have it on the table because that was the next a military firearm. You know, in the progression, and it it was the first smokeless, you know, adopted firearm that fired the smokeless round, the 30-40 crag. Uh, but but there were quite a few soldiers with these down there too, and uh, you know, black powder firing single shots. So pretty pretty interesting. Let's fire another black powder round. Uh, you know what? I gotta hit a buffalo, don't I? Let's hit that buffalo on the right. Since we're firing 4570. <laughs> Popular buffalo round. Woo! Wow. And, uh, and of course, I won't get into the politics of it, but this was using a lot of the, uh, uh, the the wars against the American Indians, of course, you know Custer. A lot of Custer's uh, men were were carrying this, and uh, they were going up against a lot of lever guns. So we, we know that just from uh, the uh, the study of that field, of those fields, and what was used from the artifacts they've been able to recover. That uh, that that was the uh, kind of the the way that went, you know. Custer, you know, the military just is all for a long time has been resistant to anything that would just fire a lot of ammo. Just, we just knew and know that soldiers would waste the ammo. And uh, they, they've always had a focus on aimed fire, you know, deliberate aimed fire. And there's a lot, of, a lot to be said for that, of course. But we've learned since then that, uh, yeah, that's all good, but it's also nice to have a lot of ammo, right, at your disposal. A disposal, uh, particularly at certain times. So, so anyway, yeah, that was uh, this thing is is was used extensively in the West, and uh, as we what would you say conquered the West, okay? Whether that was good or bad, depending on what side you fall down on, some of that uh, it was definitely a instrument of battle for sure. It, I don't know what it is about it. I think uh, single shots are kind of special anyway. And then this, the way this one operates, it's uh, it's just cool. Let's fire a smokeless round here. Okay, a couple of them. We've got some uh, things that need to be shot right here. Like this target needs a hole in it. Okay. Let's see if I can hit it from long range here. Yeah, all right. It's got a bullseye hit. We'll just leave it at that. Let's take out a two liter down there. I got a big orange one. <laughs> you know, even though this, this firearm, let's go back to black. This one, uh, that, you know, I don't know what the history would be of it, but you know, again, the receiver and everything apparently was made 1884. So yeah, who knows? Even this one that's been uh, maybe kind of a parts gun, uh, parts of it <laughs> could have been in the Spanish American war. Or involved in who knows what, the Philippines. All right. <laughs> oh, that smoke is nice. 
hopefully someday if you haven't yet you'll learn to appreciate the the wonders of black powder let's take out that other two liter <laughs> you do have to sacrifice seeing the target though if you're the shooter now if you're standing aside you can see it sometimes but you generally cannot see the target oh look at the smoke let's make some more you can't see it being hit because for some reason there's this big cloud of smoke let's go over there and hit the gong <laughs> oh, I love it nothing like the smell of black powder in the morning or in the evening what else did I not uh, lie to you about of course you've seen uh, you got the US markings on the on the firearm on the butt plate and everything the serial number is uh, apparently you know real so like I say I the one thing I'm not sure about is uh, maybe the, the breech plate there uh, why it is that it, you know, it, it's obviously been blued uh, a little bit differently of course the barrel is as well so I just don't know the exact history of that but uh, it works and it's you know, pretty much authentic best I can tell uh, it's just even if it's from parts or however whatever the history of it is there was a company I read uh, was it Bannerman that bought a lot of the parts and then they they put them together as well and so uh, anyway a neat gun uh like i say 1873 you know uh, as far as general issue you know we went from that 58 caliber you know to this and then uh the crag was the first smokeless uh rifle that uh, we issued 30 40 crag 30 caliber you know and uh, this one's 1899 model carbine you've seen it hopefully in a video it's a really cool cool rifle way it loads and everything but uh in 1892 and on up these were phased in now they didn't last long though i guess for what about 10 years and then we had the springfield the ought three and everything but uh, for a period of 10 about 10 years this was it okay and uh that was quite a, a leap going from one round to you know four or five uh pretty neat and then smokeless as well okay so you didn't leave a signature if you're firing from behind the bushes or trees you couldn't necessarily tell where uh, they, the enemy couldn't tell where we were shooting from, whereas with this, it's hard not to be able to tell when that big cloud of white smoke comes out from wherever you are, a tree stand or, or whatever. So anyway, let's shoot a little more black powder. Since we've got it dirty for you, let's stick with the black. Oh, there's a Listerine bottle that needs to be plugged right there. <laughs> I didn't put my ears in, <coughs> but you know, it didn't hurt at all. Uh, Put another black powder around in there's a jug over there with a bird sitting by it i'll try to save the spare the bird uh gave him a bath i guess at least <laughs> all right Ooh, those are messy they have to be cleaned in a special way yep they do neat i'll pick those up and sort them out i don't know if i'll load black powder again uh 45 70 or not i have done it before all right, anybody left here? Let's see if we can uh, pick off that turkey up there. I heard it. I can't see it, but yeah. It's <laughs> so we don't need no stinking sights. We don't need no stinking rear sight, do we, John? <laughs> yeah, we just sort of line up the bead and uh, it, it works okay. Uh, so again, I don't know if it's worth getting a, an authentic uh, sight on it or not, if it costs much, because I don't know that the firearm is worth all that much as a collectible piece anyway. He's kind of as a shooter, and, a, and that's what I wanted, a shooter. That's why I was looking at uh, you know, rep reproductions or considering it. But, but of course, as far as that goes, most of, as long as you're firing the correct ammo, you're not shooting really strong ammo, any of them, I guess, can be a shooter if you've got your rifling left in the barrel and that sort of thing. But again, that's why when you, if you're a hunter or you, uh, you, you, you already know this, uh, if you are and you really love the 4570, you know that anything you buy off, generally off the shelf, uh, standard, you know, 4570, although there are a lot of exceptions to that now, a lot of boutique can loaders and people who load 4570 designed specifically for a Marlin or guns that will handle it. 
But by and large, you just go to the hardware store or somewhere and you pick up a box 4570, just standard loads. It's going to be a moderate load because they're afraid, you know, they're going to get into these old guns. Okay. So just be aware of that. You don't necessarily, I think, have to shoot black powder uh, as long as you've got you know, moderate loads you know, in the things. And you'd want to get the firearm checked out. This one does appear to be in really good shape. The bore is in excellent condition, and the whole firearm is. Uh, where if you get maybe one that was made in 1873 or 1874, got a lot of pitting, maybe rusting, and uh, you, you don't know about the metallurgy, maybe it, it wouldn't hold up so well with any kind of modern powder. Don't know. You just want to always be aware, you know, err on the safe side if you're going to err at all. So what did I fail to tell you? Uh, like I said, they went to brass cases. It worked a lot better. And... Uh, and then finally moved away from the single shot to the bolt gun from this. So this this was kind of in a is in a unique era there between roughly well you could say with the, the ones that were cobbled together uh, from around 1866 uh, up through 1892 in that time period. You know we were using still using these single shot black powder breech loading you know rifles like this. Uh, and but it was the first cartridge gun that was you know issued to you know the general infantry okay you had dispensers and some others before that but as far as the main issue rifle carbine uh first big cartridge gun 4570 the same year 1873 that the 45 colt came out the 1873 winchester came out right the cartridge 4440 came out at that time called the 44 Winchester center fire. So it was a very big year. We have a video on that year that we actually filmed during that year. John filmed it. I did the talking and it was 1873. So it's an old film. It's only on VHS. Probably get it to you if you want to see it. So anyway, I don't know what else I can tell you about it. I, I feel like I probably didn't shoot it enough, but I, I guess we did. I wanted to uh, feature it uh, at least one time and we'll, maybe we'll do it again. Uh, because we just haven't done that and we've teased you with it didn't mean to <laughs> I get remarks and messages uh, fairly regularly about it uh, when you're going to do a video on the trapdoor Springfield you know oh, thought we did but we really hadn't so so anyway I hope that gives you a little more information about it uh, just a really interesting piece of, uh, of history the old 1873 uh, you know, trapdoor Springfields uh, fun to shoot and I, if you really, really like them, you wouldn't have to try to find an original. Uh, there are reproductions of them made. Uh, I don't know for a fact, but I would say they would shoot probably almost any 4570 ammo within reason without having to worry as much or made of modern steel you know, and that kind of thing. You, you know, check with the manufacturer. Uh, but, you know, they're available and they're just so cool. One more time. Look at that. How that works. Isn't that cool? You close up the breech it's locked in there and you can fire away so i don't have to tell you life is good well i hope you guys enjoyed that because i know i sure did well i've got you here i wanted to let you guys know about our friends over at sdi the sonoran desert institute they are a fully accredited online distance learning program where you can be certified in gunsmithing and you can also get an associate's degree in firearms technology and they also do a lot of work with veterans they accept the gi bill they also have hands-on experience, even though it's a distance learning program. Uh, so just wanted to let you guys know about them. Also, you can find them at sdi.edu. Uh, that's the Sonoran Desert Institute. And also, um, just want to let you guys know we have merchandise now. So if you want to uh, buy any Hickok 45 merchandise, you can go over to our store. The link is in the description of every video. And there's also a link kind of on the header of the uh, main uh, channel page, the, the, the main YouTube channel. And so we've got that. And also, if you want to find more of our content in other places, it's everywhere. Um, you can go to full30.com. We have uh, most or all of our videos over there. You can also find us on Facebook, Hickok45 Facebook. Um, you can find Hickok45 on Instagram. Uh, I think it's the real Hickok45 over there. And then also on Twitter, it's Hickok45. And then me, the son, the and son, John Hickok. You can find me at uh, Hickok45 and son on youtube i also do a podcast called gun culture radio which you can find on that youtube channel and also on itunes and there's also a john hickok facebook page which you can find the link to on the hickok 45 and son channel page there's a link over there 
And uh, that's all I can think of for now. It's a lot to digest. So you're gonna wanna think about that for a little bit and then watch one of these other videos that's like down there or over there somewhere. Um, Cause some of these look pretty good.